Today we're going to be bringing together a lot of the concepts that we've talked about into one continuous narrative. We're going to start from a data set that has absolutely no labels and talk about the process where you gather labels. Then once you have some labels, you need to learn how to create features that you can use for a classification algorithm to go from unannotated data to annotated data in a fully automatic way. I'll talk about two examples of how to do this, uh, one on a data set called Quizbowl and another on a data set called TV Tropes. And then we'll talk about once you have methods, how to evaluate your data set to show that you've done a good job. So first, let's start with the annotation process. Thus far, we've assumed that all of our data have labels already. This is not always the case. Usually, these labels come from annotation. You have someone looking at email saying whether it's spam or not. You have someone looking at a credit report saying that you should lend money to them or not. These are expensive labels. We want to automate this, but first we need to get these labels in a way that we can trust. Now, there are many examples of annotations, whether an email is spam or not, whether a document is relevant to a court case or not. This is a problem called e-discovery. Whether the noun break uh, has a particular sense, uh, a time we're not working, a stroke of luck, a fracture of discontinuity, a change in how things are done. This word can take on a number of different meanings. How do we know when it's used in a particular sentence, which meaning it's taking on? This is a problem called word census ambiguation. And this isn't just for text. If you're looking at images, you might want to be able to tell automatically whether an image has a van in it or not. The process of going from unannotated data to annotated data has a fairly common trajectory. So first, you need to decide what are the possible labels that you can use for these data. Then you need to define what each of those labels means. And then you need to have annotators annotate the same data multiple times and see if your annotators agree on the data points. And we'll talk about this quite a bit more in a little bit. If they don't agree, then you need to start from the very beginning. Figure out why they didn't agree. Are your labels somehow incorrect? Do they not cover all the possible cases? Do you have unclear definitions? Or are there just data that you didn't expect in your data set? One question that you'll have to answer is who's going to be doing the annotation? Since we're in a university right now, one of the cheapest and most plentiful resources of labor are students, either undergrads or graduate students. These are often used in academic research projects to gather annotations. If you're at a company, you may hire employees to do this annotation. There are also web services like Amazon Mechanical Turk and Crowdflower where you can find people to annotate your data for you. This gives you a very diverse population of people to work with, some of whom are very smart, very motivated, but other people just want to scam you. So it's harder to trust crowdsourcing workers, but this can be a good option. Another way of annotating your data is to get people to do it on the web for their own self-interest. This can be people on Amazon reviewing products. They're doing that to create a community. You can also get people who use their own data, provide annotations, and then will give it to you for free. This is possible if you're giving them a service. For example, web companies that provide email services ask people to annotate email whether it's spam or not, and those users have a strong incentive to provide accurate data. A little while ago, I talked about why we need annotations to agree with each other. And so why is this important? First, think about what happens to a classifier if it has inconsistent data. So very similar data, very similar features, but different annotations. For an SVM, 
the hyperplane that separates very similar data will have a very small margin and that'll be bad. For a decision tree, that means that you'll have less gain that you can obtain from the data because the features look so similar. And the bottom line is your classifier is only as good as the data it gets. And so if your annotators only agree on 40% of the data, then the accuracy of your classifier will be less than 40%. This is a super common problem. What I've seen happen is that someone is trying to use machine learning, often for the first time. They need to collect some annotated labels. They do that. They annotate each item only once. They don't compute agreement statistics. And the process just doesn't work. And what they end up doing is that they blame machine learning, but this is the standard garbage in, garbage out problem. If you don't have good input to your algorithm, then the output is going to stink. So you need to make sure that your data have agreement. There are lots of great tools out there for annotating data, WordFreak, LabelMe, Open Annotation, Bamboo, and probably others that I'm unaware of. The bottom line is that you need to annotate your data, but part of this process needs to be the computation of agreement between your annotators. And that's what we're going to be talking about next. So first, what does agreement mean? And the simple answer to the question is, agreement is how often annotators give the same answer given the same question. But it's more complicated because to be rigorous about this, you also need to adjust for the possibility that your annotators agreed by chance and gave the same answer. And this is particularly important for class imbalance data. For example, spam versus not spam email, there's a lot more of one than the other. So you can look like you have good agreement, but if there, if most of your email is spam to begin with, if everyone says spam all the time as a label for what this email is, it'll look like they're agreeing, even if for the small fraction of email that isn't spam, they never agree at all. But that's the thing that you care about the most. And so you could have a horrible system, even though it looks like you're agreeing, if you don't correct for chance agreement. So the statistic that is often used is a statistic called kappa. That's the Greek letter that looks like a K. And so what you do is you compute the probability of coders agreeing and then subtract off the probability of coders agreeing by chance. So let's see what this is in an example. So let's say that you have two annotators, annotators A and B, and you're asking them to annotate data with a binary outcome. Either, yes, it is spam, no, it isn't spam. So first, let's look at the probability of them agreeing. You have 50 data points, and they both say yes on 20, they both say no on 15, so that means that they agree with probability 0.7. So now let's take a look at the probability of chance agreement. For each of these, we need to figure out what is the probability that A will say yes or B will say yes, marginalizing over everything else. So we want the marginal probability that A and B both say yes. So to compute the probability of A saying yes, we look at the marginal sums and so 25 times he says yes, 25 times he says no. So that means that A has a yes with probability 0.5. B slightly skews more towards yes. So she says no 30 out of the 50 times. So that has probability 0.6. So the probability that both of them say yes, assuming independence is 0.3. We just multiply these numbers together. 
the probability of both of them saying no is 0.2, again multiplying the probability of no's for both of the annotators together, again assuming independence. So this means that the chance agreement probability is 0.5. So if we throw these numbers into the formula for kappa, we get a chance corrected kappa of 0.4. Typically, you want agreement above the 0.7 threshold. So this isn't too good. We would really want agreement to be better than this. So you would look at your definitions, you would look at your label set, and you would try to improve it so that you can get them to agree more often.